Shout out to the exhausted educator. <laughs> this is a Holding On To Learning LLC production. Woo! The ideas expressed on this show are not the views of their employer. Besides, if you really want to take advice from this guy, well, you should probably do it at your own risk. You're going to love the exhausted educator in <laughs> What is going on, Education Heroes? Thank you for dropping in to the Exhausted Educator Show. In today's episode, we're going to talk about co-teaching. Usually, co-teaching refers to a general education teacher and a special education teacher working together collaboratively to meet the needs, the dynamic needs of the class and the students within the, the classroom. Also under that umbrella, in a little bit more foggy terms, I guess, could be a teacher and a paraprofessional because they make up a pair as well. So really we're focusing on professionals working together as a pair. Speaking of pairs, you know, when I think of pairs working together, I think of curtains. It's a lot like curtains. You have to pull them together to get the most out of them. Come on, bald man. No more dad jokes. We don't have time for my silly jokes today. We have got a rather large episode for you. So whether you listen to it in one lump sum or you chop it up into pieces, entirely up to you. We've got a dynamic guest, and I really enjoyed talking with him. I think you're really going to enjoy listening to his insight and also his comedy. He's a funny dude. You're really going to enjoy it. That's coming up. Before we get to that, though, I need to share real quick, just like you getting ready to take your summer break. We're going to take a slight break before we move into the rest of, uh, into our next season. And probably about a month, we're going to roll back again in July. But the reason isn't just because I'm dropping off the podcasting earth for a month. Uh, Yes, I'm doing like vacation family stuff too, just like you are maybe. But uh, the, the main reason is I'm going to spend a little bit of time and focus on a couple projects Uh, that I'm also working on. So in case you missed it in a previous episode, I mentioned I am rolling out a brand new podcast, which is now, by the time you're hearing this, it will have already been out. I would have already dropped a couple audio episodes called Parents Recharged. It's all about trying to give parents ways to work with schools, trying to give parents some insight on working with their kids who may be struggling in some, some aspect, whether it be behavior, academics, social, emotional, mental health, anything in general. Um, that's what that focus is going to be on. Kind of like a, a sister or brother podcast going along with this, but it's more focused for parents. Along with that, I'm also diving into some supporting, uh, into supports for families where I do uh, is a side business Uh, meet with families and give them some extra support on how to help their struggling kid, how to link up with the school for services, how to find services outside of school. That kind of thing is uh, what I'll be doing uh, with my holding on to learning project. If you know families who who may be in need of resources or may be in need of just some help about how they can help their kid or maybe they need some ideas on Um, the overall process of going through MTSS or what it means to have an IEP, anything in general, it's pretty much the sky's the limit. I am not looking to like throw out a big business plan and gouge people for money. Matter of fact, it's all donation. So my main focus is helping families that need it. And for many families that will be uh, completely free. So throwing that out there in case you know anybody, recharge community at gmail.com will be the email that you or uh, any families can contact me and I'm happy to meet with them and see if we can figure out some some best paths, some best practices uh, to hook them up with resources. So that is all of that I'm really kind of cooking over the next month or so. The next episode besides this one will drop in July and we'll come back refreshed just like you will be as we start to think about the next year In the meantime, I want to talk to you about co-teaching and working in partnerships. Let's get going. 
here's the rundown for this episode. We're going to start off with, actually, the majority of this episode will be with Chris Stuchko, our amazing guest from the state of Pennsylvania. He's a ninth grade teacher, and he has a ton of things, ton of insights, and some great humor to go along with it about his experiences as a high school co-teacher. Uh, you're going you're gonna to really enjoy listening to him. Then we're going to dive into party time, which will be all about it takes two people to row a boat. It's actually a story about my family on vacation last year and the struggles we had in canoeing. And it will relate back to your classroom in some weird, demented way. And then we're going to finish up with you deserve to recharge this summer. Yep, here we are, June. You have made it to the finish line. It's time to kick back, relax, recharge your educational battery so you'll be ready to go at, back at it again towards the end of the summer. I want to share real quick with you some information about our special guest. Chris Stuchko is a great, great ninth grade teacher who does a wide variety of things at his school, but he's a special education teacher. He's been doing it for quite a while. He, he works collaboratively with a lot of different teachers in co-teaching settings. He's the special education side, focusing on how to support kids in the classroom. He's got a lot of great insight he's going to share with you. He's a funny dude. You're really going to enjoy listening to him. I really connected well with Chris. You know, besides the fact that we're both working in the special education field, and we also work with gen ed student, or the gen ed portion as well, we also connect because we're both Philly sports fans. Speaking of sports, his previous job focused on sports. He was working as a, a journalist after college, and he's going to dive a little bit into that, his transition into education. That's all really interesting stuff. You're going to love listening to Chris Stuchko. I am a huge fan of his work. You can also He's also going to dive into a little bit at the end his podcast, which is super special. It's really cool. The ninth grade experience, all about ninth grade. He brings in some students. He interviews uh, people in education who talk about their ninth grade experience transitioning to high school. You'll want to check that out too. Ladies and gentlemen, Chris Stutzko. Ladies and gentlemen, really excited to have Chris Stutzko on with us. And he's going to talk all about co-teaching, which is a huge, huge piece of my heart, to be honest with you, in the education world, because I've spent a lot of time as a co-teacher myself. And now uh, in my resource position, I work K to 12, and I am working with co-teaching positions all the way up to 12th grade now. And so it is one of the things I feel really strongly uh, about. And so I'm really happy to have Chris on. Chris, thanks for jumping on with me tonight. Uh, thanks, Kyle. It's a pleasure to be on. And it's, uh, you know, I live co-teaching every day, so I'm glad to be talking about it and talking about the great people that I work with. And I'm excited to, uh, to be on your show here. Yeah. And I've heard you on, and before we, you know, before we officially start recording, we talked for a good chunk of time and, uh, told you, I'd, I'd heard you on a bunch of different podcasts. And one of the thing, one of the podcasts you were diving into co-teaching and i I've really been wanting to do a, a, an episode on co-teaching. I was just looking for the right person and you were saying all the right things. So I really appreciate your time. Before we get into any of that though, man, I, you got to just share with everybody your interesting journey, your educational journey of how you've ended up to where you're at now. Sure. So, uh, but before I go into there, I just wanted to say you're the first podcaster that has approached me to come on the show. So <laughs> I appreciate you, you reaching out. Like usually, you know, podcasters were like, you know, trying to weasel our way onto other shows <laughs> and, and trying to get noticed. And, you know, I got a DM from you out of the blue on Twitter. I'm like, whoa, somebody actually heard me and wanted to be, wanted me to be on the show. So I appreciate it. Yeah, so my journey in education is a little bit 
bit different, but it seems like it's kind of one that um, a lot of my high school teachers that I work with kind of follow a similar path. So I was not the person that grew up wanting to be a teacher. I never played like school. I didn't have my, you know, things set up in rows and, you know, want to be teaching in the front of the room. So I went to a a high school and right outside of Philadelphia, um, uh, born and raised in Philadelphia. And I wanted to be the next great sports journalist. Um, and write for a newspaper. So I went to the University of Maryland um, and graduated in 2003 with a degree in journalism. Um, I was there when the basketball team won the national championship for the first time. So it was awesome. Like Maryland sports were really, really good uh, during that time. So I worked with the athletic department. I wrote for the school newspaper for a part of a season. So I was really into it. I, I did an internship at Sports Illustrated for kids in New York City, which was awesome. Oh, wow. So, so I've done lots of cool stuff. And I got into the field of journalism. This was in the early 2000s. So there wasn't, the internet was there, but it wasn't as popular as it is now. Like everyone didn't have a podcast. So I worked for a paper in Westchester, Pennsylvania called the Daily Local News. And I was there for about two years. And still at that point, like in this field of journalism, you had to have basically go really far away or have the people that have been at the paper a long time retire before you get a job. So it was uh, like 2004, 2005 time. And I'm like, you know, my, my now wife, we had a conversation. It was kind of like, what are you going to do? And um, I decided to go into the lucrative field of education. So I went back to school um, and I wanted to guarantee myself a job. And that's the honest truth. And I thought, what, what path could I go? And I'm like, special education. That's kind of what people told me. So I went to Lehigh University got my master's degree and my teaching certification at the same time. It was supposed to be a two-year program. I get there. We work at a school in the Poconos for one year, and they close our program after the first year. Oh, goodness. So, you know, here we are. Thankfully, Lehigh was nice, and they allowed me to finish my second year. And I got emergency certified to work in the Allentown School District at, at Allen High School as a life skills support teacher. And it was awesome. I did my student teaching while I was teaching in the classroom. I like to brag that I got paid to be a student teacher, which was cool. Um, I worked at Allen for three years in that, you know, capacity, you know, your traditional inner city school. I was very insulated. I worked with like a group of like 50 kids and five teachers with students with severe disabilities. And then I moved 13 years ago to Emmaus High School, which is right near Allentown. Um, And I started there in autistic support and then transitioned out to learning support and co-teaching. So that is kind of my story of how I became an educator and where I'm at today. And, you know, a little bit different of a path. And and I think a lot of those things that I have from my journalism background and other things have really helped me to, you know, bring some different perspectives to the classroom, which we'll talk about as we kind of go through like what I think anyone can kind of bring to a co-teaching model. Awesome. Awesome. And, you know, I, I have some history in, in the Allentown area too. I was saying, you know, I went to college outside of Allentown and my best friend is a principal who was on the show previously. And um, actually I did my student teaching, one of my pieces of student teaching in the inner city school in Allentown. I, I, uh, it's been many years. Moser Elementary, I think. I think that's one of them. Yeah. Yeah. I was at, yeah. I was at the high school, so I didn't know a whole lot yeah. of the uh, the elementaries. But yeah, that sounds sounds familiar. I you know we'll go with that. Li- yeah, somebody's <laughs> listening from Allentown, and and I got it wrong. Sorry. <laughs> so uh, it's it's kind of nice to have uh, somebody else from the Lehigh Valley on again and again, and uh, so you're the second person from Lehigh Valley on the show. It's pretty cool. So you have an interesting journey and I want to get into the co-teaching, but I want to pause for a second because you kind of talked about your journey up to this point now. And before I get into any of the rest of the pieces, yeah, I got to ask you this quick question. You ever get the, you're in special ed, you're a special person. You you are so patient. You ever hear that? Uh, I was just going to, I was just going to say that the patient thing is, is one that I always hear or, you know, and yeah, to be a special educator, you have to be patient. But at the same time, if you're overly patient, then that's kind of a, an issue as well, too. Um, yeah, I get that a lot. It's like, how, you know, I can never do what you do. You do, you know, amazing things. And I, I appreciate like all that stuff. Like when you're living a day to day, like sometimes you kind of get lost in the weeds of like paperwork and more mm. paperwork and the paperwork again. <laughs> but um, I think that, you know, 
it, the special education people that I work with in my school and in my district, they're fantastic. Like we're really like student first and, and we really try to work with the students and this, the staff in our buildings as well, too, to kind of support them as best we can and, and anything to like help the students. But yeah, you know, you get all the, you know, I can, I can never do that. Like, uh, but I think also too, a lot of times when you say you work in special education, a lot of people think that you work with kids that are like people they would see like in the special Olympics or mm -hmm. like down yep. students with down syndrome. That's like, that's like the big one. Like I think everybody that's not in an education thinks that anyone in special education is like students like that. Mm -hmm. And while there are, you know, it's, you know, a, you know, a lot of students that are like that, it, the majority are students that if you walked into a classroom, the, there's no, no identifying feature. Yep. They might have like a reading disability or math disability or, you know, all sorts of things. But like, I think a lot of times people have this idea that special education is just, you know, you're working with the kids that are at the special Olympics and it's like, Oh, it'll be so gratifying. And like the kids are like so nice and you know, all those things, but there's such a wide range of students in special education that it's, you know, it does take, it takes a unique person to work in a lot of the different areas. Like, you know, we have teachers that work with students that need like bathrooming and that's a yep. whole, like, there are lots of people that I work with that are special educators that have never done that. So yep. like, even within special education, there's so many different varieties of, of positions that, you know, when you say you're a special educator, like there's, there's a lot to the story. Yeah, there, there's no doubt about that. And so I, I threw that out there at you about, you know, have you gotten the, you must be a special person or really patient. So I think all of us who work in the field of special education, we've heard that at least a time or two, I think. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You're, you're right, though, by the way, the, the idea of, we call them hidden disabilities, your kids in, in many cases, gen ed classes, you know, ADHD, learning disabilities, you know, maybe some kids with with mild autism and Asperger's and such, you, know, you might not know that they have a disability uh, unless you actually take a look at their IEP, right? So somebody coming from the outside looking in. And that, to be honest with you, is a good portion of probably the population we'll be talking about tonight. We're talking about co-teaching. However, as you probably are, you know, as, as I am, you know, the idea of an inclusive model giving opportunities for kids who, who can benefit from being included in those uh, educational educational spaces where they, they can um, be involved with general education curriculum and just need maybe a little bit more support. And so can you just talk a little bit about, so you've got plenty of, you got a lot of experience in a variety of different special education roles, but can you just talk about just for anybody who's new to co-teaching or maybe they're thinking maybe that may be a role that they might end up playing in the next year or two, just kind of say some of the, maybe the key components to co-teaching. Well, one of the, I would definitely say like co-teaching, like both people are present, both people are experts in their field. So a lot of times we don't tell like uh, back to school night as an example, we don't tell the parents right away, like who does what in the classroom. Like we always tell the students, like we never introduce like, hi, I'm Mr. Stuchko. I'm the special ed teacher. Hi, I'm, I'm Mrs. So-and-so. I do the, the science. Um, but I think that's also a factor of like how comfortable each person is with the arrangement and the, the uh, you know, relationship with co-teaching. Uh, I think it's important though, that like both people are valued for what they bring to the table. Like, you know, maybe uh, the co-teacher doesn't know the content. I know in our positions, a lot of times we move from spot to spot and I've been lucky that I've kind of landed in a spot for a while. So I really know the content, but the content that I currently co-teach in, I'm not certified in. And I don't, I don't make any bones about that. Like I'm certified right now in special education, English, social studies. I have an administrative certificate and I co-teach science <laughs> and, you know, based on the needs in our district and our class, I needed to be in a science classroom. And I've been in the science room for a lot of my time as a co-teacher, but one of the things that they valued and what I brought is like the perspective of somebody that's not a science person. And I'm like, does this make sense to me as a, you know, now 40 year old adult male, if I don't get it, how can you expect a kid that's 14, 15 
to be a excited about it and b understand what we're talking about and then kind of trying to figure out how to give them that. So like, I think as in a co-teaching pairing to like have this understanding that each person is bringing something unique to the table and that they should both feel valued in that. And just because I don't know the content doesn't mean that I'm a, a lesser participant in the classroom. Um, it's kind of finding your, both people finding their niche and, you know, we've made it this far into the podcast and, you know, I hate this expression, but I feel like people always use it just like you must be special to teach special education and must be so patient. The co-teaching like a marriage thing is like, <laughs> it's the, you know, you, it's, I feel like you have to say it. It's sort of like, if you're a social studies teacher, you have to play <laughs> a part of Forrest Gump each year in one of your classes. <laughs> so like, you know, it, to talk about co-teaching, you have to say like that it's a marriage and, you know, when 50% of marriages end in divorce, maybe that's not the best, <laughs> the best strategy, but like it does, it requires definitely like give and take. And, you know, it, not everyone is made to be a co-teacher. And mm. I think it's really important that like with, in your building or with yourself, like trying to find like that comfort level of trying to, you know, figure out what you can bring to the table, or maybe you just have people that are not good pairings and they last one year and then they fall by the wayside. So like valuing each other's strengths and kind of, I don't know if exploiting is the right word, but exploiting their weaknesses so that they're not like, you know, if both of you struggle with a certain thing, then maybe that's something that you have to work on. Like, I know I worked with a co-teacher and both of us, like our, one of our banes of existence was grading. So like we would be like the slowest graders, but like we would be awesome with the kids and give them the stuff they needed all the time, but our grading was slow. And that's, you know, one of those things where if you're just open and honest up front with, with the kids, then they kind of get it. But I think as long as they know that you're together and a partnership that they kind of, it's, that's, what's best for the kids. So. Yeah. yeah. I, I think that statement is, is absolutely true. What's best for the kids. You know, I've been in a lot of classrooms and I, for many years, I've in special education at the elementary level, I was mostly a co-teacher. I also did some self-contained special education classrooms too, but um, I, I learned a long time ago the importance of just trying to bend, <laughs> you know? And so we're talking about people that you're putting together to try to figure it out and people who are not going to ha always have the same kind of teaching style and may look at things a little bit differently. And I don't know about you, but as somebody who now works with people even at the secondary level and try to guide them through their co-teaching uh, journey, I've always found that sometimes identifying roles in the classroom between the two people can be, can be a little bit tricky. You want to touch on that a little bit if, as far as who's doing what or how, how you go about figuring that out? Sure. Like, I think one of the things, and I, I always tell the kids there are like, there's like one thing that really kind of annoys me personally, like in a co-teaching pairing is like the mommy daddy thing. Right. So mm -hmm. like the kid goes to one of the people and they say no. And then they go to the other person hoping that the other teacher didn't know, like they did, they didn't know. And then it's like, well, then they ask the same question and they get a yes. Like to me, there's very little that I can like get really fired up about, but that's one of the things. And it's kind of like, when you know that both of you are kind of on the same page with like the big stuff, then that makes sense. And, you know, I think one of the things that's always challenging for special educators is like, we know, you know, sometimes kids have to kind of, we got to, you know, maybe adapt things that maybe the regular education teacher might not be too thrilled that it's being adapted or, you know, it feels like we're, you know, I don't know if we're going to be video or not, but like air quotes, yeah. watering down the curriculum, like those kinds of things. So like you, you have to remember that like the regular education teacher wants to teach their content and sometimes like they want to teach the kids too, but like, they also have the content that they're, you know, that drives what they're doing. Whereas sometimes in special education, it's like, yeah, the content's important, but like, it, you know, we got to make sure that this happens and this happens and this happens. So I think, you know, having that discussion with the co-teacher kind of like seeing where you both stand on like big issues, like the big stuff I think is important, like little things here and there, like, you're right. You probably won't agree on every single thing, but if you're united in the big stuff, whether that is like, 
planning or testing or like how kids are going to take notes or like just even like small classroom management things. I think that's really important in kind of how the class functions. Like I've seen pairings that where it's like, you know, they're two uh, like definitely opposites, but it still kind of works in the classroom because they kind of understand like where everyone's coming from. Like if you don't, if you're not open and honest with the co-teacher, then they don't really know what your perspective is. So I think that's really important is to kind of share, you know, maybe like, I don't I'm trying to think of a small example. That's not really like a big deal, but like maybe gum, gum chewing, you know, we'll go back to like school from the 1980s here, but like, you know, maybe gum chewing is something that like your co-teacher is just like, I can't, I can't deal with that. And maybe that's something that I don't really care about, but if that's like a hill that she or he wants to die on, then maybe that's a hill that you just die on in that classroom. Like, you know, all right, you know, I don't really like, that's not something I would lose any sleep over. But if, if teacher X is like, there will be no gum chewing in the classroom, like, okay, great. Then I'll, (laughs) I'll fight that battle with you. But like, you know, that's something small that like, you know, that give and take thing that you were kind of talking about, like, you kind of have to, you, you know, you as the special educator or the regular education person, like you're trying to work together for the best of the kids. And, you know, it's kind of a difference because a lot of times teachers, especially at the secondary level are used to like, this is my room. This is my Mm -hmm. curriculum. It's my area. And you're just kind of here. And I, thankfully I haven't run into that much um, at all. Really. I've kind of been really lucky with like the people that I've worked with all, and it's been a lot of different ones based on our schedule and stuff. But I, I think just having those upfront conversations about what are the important things for both of you, and hopefully they're remotely the same. Yeah. And uh, you know, if not, then just kind of hashing that out through the year. But I think just knowing where everyone stands on stuff is really important. I, I think you're, you're hitting it, hitting the nail right on the head. I honestly believe the beginning piece of the year is so important for co-teachers, right? So one thing I'll share with administrators is asking the question, is it possible to make sure that they know who their co-teaching partner is a couple of weeks before the school year starts, right? So that maybe you at least offer up a little bit of time so they can call somebody and be like flush some stuff out, or maybe they can get together, you know, and, and have a, have a sip of milk together and talk about, (laughs) talk, talk about, you know, what their ideas are, their philosophies of education, because it's always tough. What happens a lot of times the beginning of the year is we're loaded up within services and we don't have as enough time to maybe sit down and talk with, and especially at secondary level, many times multiple partners that you're teaching with, and just not enough time to sit down and figure out who this person is, especially if they're brand new to you. Um, and then what their ideas are of how the classroom would run, what your ideas are as far as how you would work with them. What kind of support systems are you going to put in place? What kind of, like you said, classroom management's a big one. And then this one is a huge piece to the puzzle. And this one I want to go next, planning. And so planning is ultra tough, especially at the secondary level. A lot of times at the elementary a lot of times the two teachers will have a similar planning period and they can work things, work things out together. But do you have any, you know, to be able to, to plan with somebody, especially if you don't have a set time during the day to sit down and be like, Hey, let's look at our lessons for next week. Any general ideas and, and suggestions on, on how you go about co-planning with your, your teaching partner or your partners? Uh, Well, luckily for us, uh, previous years, we had had actually built into like, we would get time offered to us like after school, like once a week to be able to plan for like 30 minutes, which is just a small amount, but it it was, you know, an amount that was appreciated Mm -hmm. um, with like stuff that's happened in the last couple of years. That's kind of fallen by the wayside a little bit, but we're hoping to bring that back for the future. Um, I think when you're, when you're newly partnered, I think it's really important to try to find that time. And this is just what I have found is that planning for a couple minutes at a time was effective for me. Like I didn't, there were times when I didn't have that half an hour chunk, but maybe I had five minutes at the end of class or between classes and the people that I worked with next would allow me to kind of like be a minute or two late. Um, And that's like one of those things with special education, like we're always kind of going places like, you know, I've worked now for 13 years in my, my spot. And I've never had a classroom that I taught in all day long, like my own room. So I'm always kind of on the move, 
But I have found that like planning in small chunks is better than that like half an hour block. And once you kind of like are familiar with the the content and your co-teacher, like I have found that like you can easily like a lot more easier plan on the fly. Like not like saying like just fly by the seat of your pants when you go in, but like you kind of know where the class is going. So you can kind of you know, like what's next, you know, what the, the sequence of like the curriculum is, you know, like that this thing might require like a little bit more scaffolding, or you might, you get to know like what the, each of you kind of need and where your strengths are. Um, so I don't have like a great, like, you know, I'm not going to tell you like meet for coffee on Sunday mornings. Like <laughs> the, no one's going to do that. Like, you know, right now, like, you know, you're the exhausted educator podcast. So like, we're all exhausted asking people to do, you know, more stuff outside of our normal day is just not something right now. People are like, yes, I will go plan with person X. Like, do you want to meet on like Friday at eight o'clock? Like, no, nobody wants to do that. So like finding those small pieces during the day or like just natural times to be like, Hey, like, is this working? Yes, it's working. We're going to keep going. And a lot of times that I've worked with the content specialist in the room, like kind of knows where the, the bus is going. So as the special education teacher, like I can kind of like ride along the bus. And then when I see that, like, we need to like, maybe either slow it down, or if we need to like do a little bit more detail with stuff, or like, even like, like, I know that student A, B, and C are not getting it. Like I will kind of meet with them tomorrow, or I'll kind of make sure that we need to touch base with these kind of people. So, you know, I don't have like this, like, you know, pie in the sky idea. Like hopefully the districts that people are listening to offer them some sort of planning time, you know, maybe if, you know, you're working in an ideal building, the co-teacher and the regular education teacher have planning time together, which is awesome. That's worked out for me every once in a while, like with our planning and our uh, stuff are together. Um, so that's been nice, but you know, this, the couple minutes that you get here and there are really important. And then building that, like you said, building that relationship, if you're new, like trying, that might take a little bit of extra time, but you know, right now I work with people like, because my knowledge of the content is strong, I can kind of just jump in and be like, yes, we're, I know where we're going. We're good. You good. Like, do we need to do anything? We're okay. But that's like, this will be my sixth year in the class that I'm in and I've worked with the people that I've worked with before. So it's, it's, yep. it, it's, it comes with time. And, you know, one of those things you always hear about co-teaching is like, I can't get any consistency. They keep breaking us up and hopefully the buildings that you work in value that consistency because that's where the real co-teaching comes in when you can be consistent and you really get to know somebody as opposed to like, you know, you're with five different people this year five different people next year. Like, like you said, like you get to meet these people three days before you start. Like that's just not a recipe for success in the co-teaching yep. model because, you know, we're adults. We have ideas on how we like things to work. And like, if you don't have the time to really like go through and, and develop that relationship, it does make it extremely difficult. I think so. You know, the, the idea of having to start over consistently every year with somebody new and learn how to work with somebody new consistently every year. I'm afraid it pretty much just sends a lot of people packing, like, you know, especially in the special ed world, like mm, I've tried this and I'm working with four different teachers this year. And next year I'm going to work with four different teachers again. And I think I'm going to take my business and go elsewhere. And, and you know, as well as I do, teachers are hard to find right now. Special ed teachers have always been hard to find. And, and my personal opinion is that collectively as a campus, we just all need to support each other. And if you've got individuals who are willing to do the work to help your neediest kids on that campus, let's make sure that we're trying to work with them to, to help bring them along, do what we can to be flexible so that they get maybe the consistency of the same partner over and over again. It sounds like you're in a great situation where you get that the a similar partner and you get the build up, you know, you get the you get better collectively as a group over time that way. I think you, you yeah. agree with that? Yeah, definitely. But I also want to chime in too and say like that I think it's important that like all the teachers in the building should and can be co-teachers. Because mm -hmm. I think one of the things that happens is 
you know, and I'm sure you've heard this, like we're hitting all the buzzword phrases tonight. You're so, <laughs> you're so good with those kids. Mm. And what happens mm. is when you get people that are quote, so good with those kids, they're always the people that are the co-teachers mm -hmm. and it's hard. Like, it's really hard. Like when you're consistently working with the same group and then you look down the hall and your colleague is teaching the AP and the honors level classes of your subject every year, because you're so good with those kids, <laughs> it gets to be hard. Yeah. And I think like having it be equitable for all the teachers in a certain area to be able to co-teach or to at least, you know, get, at least try it, I think is really important because, you know, as a, as a special education teacher, like it is, it, it's, it's tough to like work with kids that are always constantly challenging. Like not every kid, but like my day is working with students that always need extra support. Mm -hmm. And it's like, every day it's this, it's that same thing. And like, you know, when you have your co-teacher who's also in the same boat of like doing that and we're doing it over and over every day, six times a day or four times a day or however many blocks are in your day, like it, it gets to be draining after a while. So I think it's really important that like that idea of co-teaching is, is kind of like a universal like thought process in a building that anyone should be able to co-teach or anyone should be able to teach your, you know, I'll just use the old school, like general prep classes or like, you know, classes that aren't your honors level classes. Cause I think it's really important that like those students get to see some different people in there as well too. So, you know, I, I do enjoy that you're so good with those people and like my, I have co-teachers and that's, they are the same people and they are like, you know, but they're also, again, coming back to the title of your show, they're exhausted. They're mm -hmm. exhausted from doing it year after year. Yeah. They're the go-to person every year because yep. they know how to work with those students yep. and it's tough. So, you know, I feel you know, for this, for the regular education or the general education teacher as well, too, who, you know, they, they work well with our, our students that are in co-talk classes, but it's just like every year they, they get the same thing. And like, eventually they're just like, I can't do this anymore. And yeah. it's not an indication on you. And maybe sometimes it is having that second person, but it's just really hard. And, and it's, it's not easy to do it year after year after year. So, yep. you know, yeah, if, I, if I agree. It, if you're in it and you kind of have developed good relationships, it makes it a lot easier. I'll, I'll tell you that. But like, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're working with the students that need the most support and it's constant and it's, yeah. it's tough. So it's, you know, co-teaching isn't for everybody, but everyone should be able to, you know, at least try it or, you know, be exposed to students and maybe like not even co-teaching, but having students in your class, if it's not a co-taught class with IEPs and like, how do we respond to that? Like, that's a whole nother special education conversation that we're not having tonight. We're talking yep. more about like the co-teaching model, but like, you know, in the last couple of years in our district, we've had students that are like college prep level honors, even AP that have IEPs. And like, how are we helping those kids? Yep. It's an entirely different conversation. But again, it's like they're, they have IEPs, but they're not in the co-taught setting. What do we do with them? Yep. And that's, you know, I think that's all over the place. So like you said earlier, students with anxiety or ADHD or mental health issues or executive functioning issues that yep. are that can function in all these classes, but they still need that extra support. So there's yep. a lot of different layers to it. Um, the co-teaching part is definitely, you know, is, is part of it, but there's a lot of other areas to special education that maybe are not, you know, that aren't as, as out there as co-teaching. So lots yeah. of different, lots of different things to think about in the conversation here. But again, I think coming back to the original point of like, you know, making sure that, the people that are doing it, like they're into it and they're doing it, but also remembering that like everyone in your building should be able to be able to do it as well too. Yeah, I agree with that. And you know what? I think a lot of times we fall short. We fall short in how we're supporting the gen ed teacher, because especially if they're new to co-teaching, you know, how, you know, what, what are we doing as at the building level or at the district level, as far as are we giving them any, training so that they know what they're getting into do they have any back if they don't have any background as far as understanding what an iep is you know are we giving them opportunities to understand how kids get accommodated or or what support systems look like in the classroom and i know that 
it's one of those things that can kind of get put on the back burner because a lot of times it feels like an administrator, especially at secondary level, your numbers are so high. And I know your school district that I think probably are where we're at. We have similar size school districts. You know, there's a lot of kids and you got a lot of kids in a classroom and you're, you got a lot of things to balance schedule wise. So there's not a ton of time to think about, you know, what are we going to do to make sure this, this uh, science gen ed teacher gets some extra um, training on how to work with their new co-teaching partner that kind of gets pushed on the wayside. And a lot of times it's like, get in there, tiger, go get them and you'll figure it out. And, yeah. and that's not the best recipe for success either. Yeah, absolutely. It all comes back to the, you know, I should have made a count like buzzword number four, like time, <laughs> like it always comes back to the time issue. Like when do we have the time to do these things and have, you know, in our district at, at some points we had like a co-teaching, like, I guess academy was the right word, but we did like summer professional development where you kind of, we talked about different models of co-teaching, but that's not every summer. So, you know, if you have somebody that didn't co-teach at that time, they maybe weren't exposed to it. So it's hard. It's hard to kind of do that and, you know, uh, throw it on to somebody that maybe hasn't done it before, but um, you know, just trying to do the best to support them and, and think, I think that's why I think at least in our district, they think about like who's being paired and who are they asking to co-teach and, and making sure that they have the right fits for the certain classes. So hopefully wherever you are listening and you're hopefully, if you're a co-teacher or not, like the people in the district level or the building level are thinking about those things because it's important that, you know, when you have like a first year teach, like I've worked with like first year teachers and, you know, I was a veteran teacher. So like, how does that person who's new to the classroom, you know, they're 20 some odd years old working with somebody that's 37, you know, and as a co-teacher and, you know, has done it, but you haven't yeah. done it. Like that's even like that weird dynamic there of like, how do you work with somebody? Like I'm the content teacher, but this person in there is, you know, been a teacher for 14 years. Like, how is that part of yeah. a relationship? It's Intimidating. Like, there's so many different phases, like to working in special education. I know when I got into it and in, like my, autistic support and uh, life skills, I was working with like instructional assistants or like um, paraprofessionals. And at that point I was like in my early twenties and I'm not their supervisor. I'm working with, you know, women in their like, you know, moms that are in their forties that have been there for a while. And it's like, well, who is this young punk telling me like how to like help these kids? I've been helping these kids for 10 years. Like why, like what's, there's like so many different dynamics in like our special education classrooms that are like really interesting to kind of like work through, but the co-teaching one can be different because of like all the different experiences, expertises, stuff like that as well too. Yeah. And I, I'll try to wrap up here. Cause we, I feel like I could talk to you for hours about this topic. <laughs> um, but you touched on something to back up a little bit. You just nudged into it a little bit, like the idea of instructional models. The last thing I will say is that I honestly believe we need to, in, in, co in the co-teaching world, you got two people in your classroom. That can make a big time difference. So if all you're doing is have just one person teach from the front of the room and the other person just kind of bounces around, maybe helps out here and there, I think there's better ways to maximize your time. There's not, it's not that that's not a model. That's a, it's an instructional model that can be used. It's successful, but there's other pieces of the puzzle. If you can get both, both the parties, meaning both their staff members on board with how they're going to plan or how they're going to provide instruction, you can be more creative and you can, you can, number one, you can support all your students a lot, a lot more effectively if, if you have another model of instruction but um, just in general, it's easier to bring novelty to the classroom and it's easier to help all the kids who need, need uh, some extra support. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. I think when both people are like co-teaching, then you take ownership of all the kids. It's not like the, you know, number five, my kids and your kids, <laughs> like, you know, it's like one of those, like they're our kids. And that's one that's common in like co-teaching models. So like, Again, it's one of those things where once you get people to buy into like that and, you know, can you, can one of you be the fun one and one of you be the serious one? Sure. Like you can have all sorts of models, but like, you know, the kids, the kids pick up on it. The kids pick up on it fast. If like the pairing doesn't work, like they know the kids yep. know, like they kind of figure out too, like, if you're not really like in, into the con, like, if you don't know the content that well, the kids pick that up, like it's, yep. they're not, you know they're kids. They're, they're, you know, 14 to 15 at the high school level that I work with. It's like, 
they, they see it. But I think as long as you're both genuinely like you care about them um, and that they know that you're there for your, their best interest, I think that's where they can kind of, um, they, they, they buy in. They buy into you as, as a pair first. And then, you know, then they buy into what you're trying to teach them. If they buy into you guys, to, to the group or the pairing, then that's the, that's the, that's the part that's really important, you know, building the relationships and, you know, all the stuff we're hearing, especially coming out of the pandemic with like SEL and all that stuff. But like in a co-teaching model, that's really critical. Like they have to buy into your kind of collaboration there. And if they just see one person in the front all the time and the other person's kind of like in and out or, you know, maybe not there, like they, they know that. And then they kind of see the value in, in those kinds of things. So, yeah, yeah you know, I was going to say Sage on the stage. That's one of those <laughs> ones that always comes up too. So I guess that's number six. I told you before we were recording, I wasn't going to be all the, uh, go do all the, uh, the teacher things and all those, you know, corny phrases, but I've, I guess I've <laughs> kind of, uh, I, I started doing it myself and counting. So there you go. Oh man, I appreciate you. And thank you for all your time. And hold on a second. Sorry about that. My phone's going off. I appreciate you and, and really appreciate your time. And, and I honestly, maybe, maybe we need to have you back in and go even further and deeper into this discussion because there's so many other branches we could get into. But I want to spend the last minute or two or even a couple more if you need it. So you can talk about your podcast because I think your podcast is really unique and I absolutely, I just love the the way you're incorporating a variety of different things. But I don't want to spoil it. I don't want you to be able to talk about it. So could you talk to the audience a little bit about your your ninth grade experience podcast? Sure. Thanks. So yeah. So I have a podcast. You know who who does it in education these days? But now it's a <laughs> uh, it's going. I just did my uh, well. The next episode I publish will be in theory, the hundredth, but like I've run some repeat episodes. So, um, I started the podcast in May of 2019. So what I'm hoping to do in the last couple of weeks of school here is talk to, I will have students that I talk to as freshmen that are graduating this year. So I want to kind of go back and do a little revisit with them and kind of see where they're at after awesome. four years. So I have the, the pod, the theme of the podcast is talking about students, ninth grade experiences. And it's one of those things where, you know, if you're a parent, if you're a teacher, or if you're a student, like we've all kind of gone through ninth grade. So I know a lot of times that, you know, student people will graduate high school, but not everyone does. So like telling the 12th grade story is kind of like, eh, we, we, you know, not everyone makes it, but I would say 99.9% .9 of people go to ninth grade. So, and a lot of times they have a, some sort of story or memory that they remember from that ninth grade year that maybe motivated them to do something they're currently doing. If you're an adult, maybe that's the year that you wanted to be a teacher or whatever, or, you know, some sort of memory that kind of really makes school stand out. So uh, I needed to come up with an idea for a podcast to, to win a grant at my school. Uh, the first year I applied, I didn't get it because I didn't know what I wanted to do. I just said, I want to start a podcast. Please let me buy $500 <laughs> worth of cool stuff. So the second time I did it, I was more focused and I wanted to focus on the stories of ninth grade students and kind of focus on that, that transition year from eighth to ninth grade and kind of go from there. So um, it, one of the things that I think is unique about what I do is I try to talk to students about what's going on in their lives. Like that's kind of the whole, that was the whole purpose was talking to ninth graders about what goes on in ninth grade. So it's really important to me. And that the focus is like talking to students. Now I do, I have teachers and other experts on shore because, you know, I like to mix it in there, but you know, I've had podcast episodes about uh, one recent one that we were talking about before was we do an event at our high school called Shave for the Brave. It's actually like the event. Like if somebody asked me about Emmaus High School, there are two things. We have a, an amazing field hockey program that is like nationally regarded, like number one in the nation. And that's not an exaggeration. It's like they are the number one field hockey program in the country. And the second one is we do an event called Shave for the Brave. Every two years, they raise money for pediatric cancer through the St. Baldrick's Foundation. And it's grown every, I've one of two people that have done this shaving every year that they've done it. Awesome. And it's grown from an event that raised like $20,000 this first year to this year, it raised over $150,000 for pediatric cancer. And on the, one of the recent podcast episodes I had, we have a, a current freshman student 
who is going through their own cancer battle. And he came on and talked and told his story. Um, I had students last year from an organization called Students Organized Against Organizing Against Racism. And they came on and told their story about how they are dealing with that in our school district and dealing with those things and trying to get out like positive messages and trying to create change, like from basically grassroots. Um, an episode I had last year was with a student who at that point had COVID and I hadn't heard a lot of students telling a story of COVID. This was like December of 2020. So this was not this year. It was the previous year. And, you know, the kid told this story and it was like at Christmas time and he was quarantined from his family from like Thanksgiving to Christmas. Oh my Lord. And he was like, I couldn't like hug my family at Christmas time. I'm oh, like, oh my gosh, like, you know, that's a story at that point that like we weren't hearing from like a lot of students. Mm -hmm. So being able to tell those stories of like what students are going through in ninth grade it's just really cool. And when you talk to adults and like, we're kind of like, you know, in a normal podcast, I would have turned it around on you here and asked you about your ninth grade experience. Maybe we'll have to do that <laughs> another time. But there is um, a story to tell there. It yeah. didn't go great to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but most times adults can pinpoint a story from ninth grade, good or bad. Um, and it's like a change, a thing that changes them. And I think it's really important to tell that story. And, um, and yeah, I, I it's just, it, it's a unique perspective on the education podcast world. And I'm really excited to continue it and to be part of like the education podcast network, which I'm a part of with like Chris Nessie and, and that group. So it's really cool to be a part of that and to see where it's growing and kind of, you know, expand the video. Like YouTube has been really popular for us in the last like two years with the pandemic, like people are watching it. They show it in school as part of our advisory. So they show the video. So it's really neat. And it's, it's cool to be able to tell stories. And like we talked about early on, I was a journalist and I was looking for an outlet and this was it like doing the podcast three years ago, four years ago was going to be my way to get myself back involved in it. And, and it's been awesome. So, you know, I have my shirt on, it's a one on one it. here. So, <laughs> you know, I, you know, the logo was designed by somebody at the school. So it's really cool. And um, yeah, it's ninthgradeexperience.com and you can go there and check it out and do all the subscribing and the following and YouTube videos are there and everything. And, and if you're listening and you teach at a school that has a, somebody with a unique ninth grade story, I'm trying next year to start branching out to outside of my own school with the stories. So if you have a unique ninth grader or ninth graders coming up, like, you know, maybe you're listening and you have, there's this kid that I saw a video of this year. That's like seven foot five in ninth grade. And I wow. want to find this kid. And like, he's this like, I don't know if he's an amazing basketball player, but he's tall. So, <laughs> you know, finding stories like that. So if you have, if you're listening and you have a cool ninth grade story, I'd love to hear it. Um, you can just go to the website and um, there's a contact thing there and you can check it out. Awesome. So you're saying he's like the Sean Bradley of, of the freshman basketball team for anybody outside of the Philly Sean, area that yeah, have no Sean, idea who that is. Yeah. Sean Bradley. That's an, it's an oldie, but a goodie there. Yeah. He was <laughs> seven foot six and, and you know, all of the great players of that time period in like the mid nineties, like hunted him out and tried to dunk on him. I think Shaq <laughs> dunked on him a couple of times. Like people would like literally hunt him on the court <laughs> and dunk on him. So yeah, oh, great, man. great six or second pick overall in the draft that year. Yeah. I think that was the Tim. No, that wasn't the Tim Duncan year. That was Keith Van Horn. So right. Right. yeah, Sean Bradley who went away on a mission trip. So there you go. Yep. Like I'm sure when you're listening to this, if you've made it all the way this far and you want to hear random <laughs> Philadelphia sports stuff, you know, maybe we'll have to come back on and have a random Philadelphia <laughs> sports right. podcast. That's right. <laughs> oh man. Well, I'll let you get running uh, it, real quick. You know, if they want to hook up with you on uh, social media, but where can they find you on Twitter? I am at Chris Stuchko. So I'll spell it real fast. And you know, my journalism day. So it's at C H R I S S T U C H K O that's on Twitter. I'm on Instagram at ninth grade experience. And I'm on TikTok. I have night it's at ninth grade experience. I have one follower and <laughs> one subscriber and uh, I haven't posted anything yet, but that's going to be a 23, uh, 22, 23 goal is to get on TikTok and, and use that to kind of reach the kids because that's where they yep, are. So I have to, are, yep. I always have to be kind of thinking about that. Like 
I have this podcast and I know people listen to it and might watch it, but like, are the kids really watching it? I don't know, but I know that they're on TikTok. I know they're on Snapchat. I know they're on all these other things. So that's, yep. you know, as when, you know, not that I'm not busy enough, but trying to find that kind of like the lane of how to get kids involved with it as well too. So there you go. So, yeah. So, but Twitter yeah, is where I, I hang out on Twitter a lot. And, yeah. um, you know, that's where all the, the education got a lot of educated shows. people. So, yep, that's so, true. Yeah. So I'm there, you know, the DMS are open and, you know, love to hear your ninth grade stories, or if you want to come on, maybe you have an amazing ninth grade story or you're a ninth grade administrator or, you know, whatever it is. And uh, I'll be glad to have a conversation with you about it. And, and, you know, this summer we got to fill space. So if you're, there you go. You want to come on be my guest. Yep. Sounds good. Well, so let's make sure we, we uh, pump this guy's TikTok numbers up and let's get him uh, some follows and subscribes on, uh, on uh, YouTube as well. So, <laughs> Chris, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. And, and uh, maybe we do this again soon. We could dive even deeper on co-teaching or we could just talk about the birds, you know, and, and you'll, how, you'll be, how, how they're going to win the Super Bowl in like, you know, 2035 again. 2035? <laughs> well, no way. Next year, we got to, you got to, you got to be the, the optimistic Philly fan. So uh, you'll be, you know, this would be a new one for me. I'd be invited on by the same person twice. That's in the history of podcasting, that's never happened on any <laughs> show ever. So, you know, there you go. But we'll yeah, hook no. it up. <laughs> yeah, bad Philadelphia sports and co-teaching. It's a it's a great combo. So yeah, come sure come is. for the co-teaching and stay for the for the bad sports talk. Uh, thanks so much, man. Let me get us out of here. <laughs> Party time. In this edition of Party Time, I'm going to share with you a quick story about canoeing. And a canoeing trip that my family <laughs> attempted to do last summer that didn't turn out too well. And it's going to relate back to your classroom in some weird, demented way. So let me take you back. Last June, my family and I, we were really excited to go to the western portion of Virginia and have a vacation in the mountains. And we went to, we did things like Luray Caverns and it was just a great, great few days. We rented a cabin up on, on, on a mountain and, and had a great time. One of the activities that we decided to do was canoeing. Now, my wife had said to me prior to this trip, and she shocked me really, she said, you know what, I want to try a few things outside of my comfort zone. She said, <laughs> we could try a ropes course which suspend, basically would suspend us all about uh, 12 to 20 feet up in the air, and you balance on ropes. And she did give that a go. She didn't make it all the way up, but she gave it a go. She's a real trooper. And this is really not her cup of tea. <laughs> Adventure sports are not her cup of tea, but she gave it a go. She also shocked me when she said she thought canoeing would be a great idea. Because really... My wife and my kids are not huge, we'll say, huge boaters, right? They, they, they're not really comfortable being out on the water. We've been out a few times. We took a, a ferry once. Uh, we've been you know, out in paddle boats, those kinds of things. I love it. But the rest of my family, eh, not so much. However, she shocked me. She said, let's give it a go. So we did some researching, and I found this place. It's right there, right near where we were staying, and it was a big to-do, but it's supposed to be for beginners. Super easy, right? Just super easy. Get your canoe in and enjoy a, you know, just a kickback, relaxing ride down the stream. That is not how it was at all. So here's what happened. My family and I, we show up. And in my head, I had pictured just this quiet little place, you know, like a little shack that had some canoes, and they hook you up. And, uh, well, we rolled up there, and there were people all over the place. And you go to the shack, and you, you it was a large shack, not a small one, and it wasn't very quiet. You go there, and you register yourself, you, you know, hook up your tickets or whatever that you get. They put you on a bus, and they send you upriver. At the river, when we walked out and took a look at it, I quickly realized this is not a just slow little stream. Now, for those of you who maybe spend some time on the water, 
this is not like white water rafting. I'm not talking like this is, you know, gonna you you're really gonna need to bring your helmet and and go hard. It's nothing like that. However, that that current it purred, <laughs> it moved, and the very unfortunate thing was, my family and I we didn't have an opportunity to practice because as soon as you hit the water, it was go time. Now, we had five of us, two canoes. So, in my head, I thought, I'm going to take my one daughter, and I will pretty much canoe myself, and she can just ride with me. My wife can take my son, who is a teenager. He'll be happy to help. And my daughter, who is just a really good sport, she'll just kind of ride along in the middle of them, and she's not really going to do any paddling or anything she's going to be there for moral support which is kind of it's one of her strengths it's what she does she's a really positive person so in reality in their boat is two people in my boat i'm just going to kind of do my thing and i have i'm not like the world's greatest canoeer in the world but i can do it I've, i've done it before so it wasn't new to me my wife has been canoeing but it was many years ago and it was just kind of like in like a water that hardly moved at all so Unfortunately, because there was no like slow pond to practice in, it was get in the water and go. Now, that made my wife uncomfortable, rightly so. However, to compound the problems, my son, being a teenager, was not excessively happy with the fact that we were canoeing fairly early in the morning. He was just on the grumpy side. And so what happened was him and my wife were in a canoe together. In my head, I'm thinking my son will be super helpful. He's not done a lot of canoeing, but I have had him out in a canoe before, you know, a couple years prior. Maybe he can be helpful. That was not the case. (laughs) Instead, my grumpy son decided to pretty much say nothing and not really do a whole lot of work. So what ended up happening... (laughs) was almost a disaster because they couldn't get their ends right and they just spun in circles for a little while and the boat rocked, the canoe rocked back and forth. At one point, they got stuck on a rock and they couldn't get off and I'd already moved down so I'm trying to paddle back upstream against the current which wasn't easy but luckily about the time I got back up there, they, they were able to unlodge themselves And continue to go on. But they almost tipped the canoe. It was close. And then they went on down further. And somehow, someway. There was a big tree. That had fallen down into the water. And my wife and my son. They got caught up in that tree. There was all kinds of uh, howls and and such from my wife who was it kind of looked like she was getting sucked into the tree luckily they made it out they went down and they were able to exit we made it through again i was fine but my wife and my son that trip the two of them was a disaster what does that have to do with you and your your classroom not a lot but maybe this so The importance of working in two, it is really important that there's communication. (laughs) There was none from my son. He was not happy to do it. He was not, my wife was trying to to talk back and forth with him about, you know, which side are you, you, you paddling on? Where are we going? And he was not having it. So there was no communication, really. He was just not happy about being there and experiencing the whole thing. Also, the other piece would be this. Besides communication, when you start a school year, it is not easy to learn just as you're rowing a boat or as those people will say, learn while you're flying the plane. It's just that you learn learn how how you're building it when you're flying the plane. It's just not an easy approach, but it's what we do in in co-teaching settings a lot of times. It's, I'll pick this person and this person, they're going to teach together, figure it out. Well, if you don't have time ahead, 
to maybe not necessarily practice, but at least to talk, it's tough to figure it out. Sometimes it works. Occasionally, you know, sometimes people are able to figure it out. But what I know about co-teaching is you are much more likely to have early success if you have had good communication. You sat down together prior to the school year and talked about something. How are you going to plan? Are we going to open up a Google Doc and plan back and forth? Are we going to, uh, am I just going to call you? Do we have a common planning time? How's that going to work? How is the classroom management going to work? What are your ideas on how we manage behaviors? What are your ideas on how we manage homework? What are your, Just having collective uh, conversations. What are uh, the roles of each individual in the classroom? Are we going to split up the teaching from the cl- uh, front of the room? Are we going to break into uh, what we would call parallel teaching groups, right? Where we'd split the groups. Are we going to do stations and we're both going to sit at a station and support whatever your instruction looks like in those specific classrooms in those lessons those are all those are all conversations you can have ahead of time who likes to do what what are your strengths what are the things that maybe you don't do well hard conversations yes important conversations absolutely the more you do at the beginning of the year the smoother the ride believe me You don't want to ride in a canoe when your partner is not doing much. You don't want to teach in the classroom. It's certainly not as as much of a happy place if your partner is not on board with you. So do what you can to get ready for the upcoming year. And administrators, if it's possible, try to let your co-teachers know who they're working with a little bit ahead of the year so they have time to prep. Congratulations. Congratulations, people. You should be patting yourself on the back for working your way through what has been an ultra-challenging year. Success can be measured in a wide variety of ways. My personal preference, I don't really like to measure success for educators as how well you did on a state test. Is it an indicator I guess it can be, but you know what really matters? The growth of your students. So take a few minutes, now that you've come to the finish line, and think way back to the struggles, the trials, the tribulations you may have had in September, October, and think about those individual students and ask yourself, have they grown academically? Have they grown behaviorally? Have they grown socially? Have they grown emotionally? Have they made gains? If you're answering yes for some of those students, pat yourself on the back because this has been a whirlwind of a year, which has been surprising, but it really has been. So you deserve now to be able to have enough time to reflect on the year and take a break. Unplug from education for a while. Do whatever it is that you need to do to recharge your educational battery. You deserve it. Congratulations again. Quick reminder, remember, we're not going to drop an episode for a little while. Probably going to get to it in July, but if you need your fix, you can check out our new Parents Recharge podcast that's out and there's a few episodes there already, and those will continue to drop every other Thursday, just like this will when we come back in July. Every other Thursday, you can get an episode. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you take care of yourself so you can take care of them. But I also hope you sit back, relax, enjoy a Mai Tai, a glass of milk, or whatever else you want to have, turn on some great music, and go on vacation or read a book, whatever you need. Just recharge your educational battery. Thanks for stopping by. We'll see you again soon. Party time! It's like, boo, boo, boo! Sirens are going off in my head! 
we're going to try to just not be horrible. I'm watching you, exhausting entertainers. Always watching. Last is <laughs> the best.